Uh, Yelp has its own problems, so you can ar argue about that. But um, but it's you know it's it's not surprising that Google uh, ranks its own stuff higher. Uh, those of us in marketing and uh, SEO and stuff have known that for a long time. YouTube videos get higher ranking than other video sites. Um, so it's sort of uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of no duh, but this makes it official. The report makes it official. So. I think that needs to be a new segment. <laughs> No duh department because <laughs> there's you know there's a few of those every week like okay that's to be expected what did you think was going to happen so we have a story that we uh, disagree on I have it in worse and you have it in best so and that story is Starbucks and um, this week um, baristas at twelve thousand Starbucks locations were given the task of starting conversations with customers about race relations. They were asked to write a hashtag race together on customers' coffee cups to spark discussions. And um, CEO Howard Schultz, for whom I have the greatest of respect, says the campaign was um, inspired by a company forum that they had in December and 40% of their nearly 200,000 employees are part of a racial minority group. And so unfortunately, the reception to the campaign was overwhelmingly negative. And um, many people, there was a backlash that began. And um, that night, Corey Dubrow, Starbucks Senior VP of Communications, deleted his Twitter account, which is why I have it in the worst of of uh, category because he said I was personally attacked through my Twitter account around midnight and tweets represented a distraction from the respectful conversation we're trying to start here around race together uh, but that wasn't the answer and so some of the things that came about was uh, Josh Hogan said they can't even call a coffee a small how the hell is Starbucks gonna fix racism and um, somebody else said uh, Starbucks uh, at Corey do wanted to talk about race so much he deleted his account about after people started talking to him about it and and then he came back in medium and he explained why he had done it well and then the, the hashtag got hijacked and um the uh hijack was new starbucks drinks i can't be racist because i had two black coffees uh was a, a tweet, tweet by somebody named des and um house negroes and filter negroes new starbucks drinks uh which mocha latte can't jump new starbucks drinks now i just want to say before you tell us why you think this was great that i if howard schultz would run for president i would vote for him because i think he's remarkably progressive i think he has tried to start conversations around issues that needed conversation but do not talk to me before i am caffeinated if i walked into starbucks and you asked me to have a conversation about something that weighty i'd have to walk out i can't talk before i have coffee <laughs> well, the uh, the uh, there there are problems with this campaign, and you've listed some of them. So I mean, you can't have a you can't you can't lead and try and spark conversations about race, and then have your chief communicator delete his account and not not talk about right. what you want to talk about, right? Yeah. Um, Twitter is not the place to have a discussion on race. You can't have a, 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 a good discussion on, on racial, racial issues in 140 characters. It's just not possible. Exactly. The anonymity on Twitter is going to spark that, those types of reactions, right? So I'm not surprised he deleted an account. I don't doubt that he got a lot of nasty, uh, nasty responses. Uh, he shouldn't have done it anyway. Anyway, so my... It, I think the effort needs to be applauded. Uh, there are pr plenty of problems with it. You detailed some of them. Uh, it puts employees in an awkward situation, right? So I walked into my uh, into my Starbucks yesterday and uh, took a picture of the display for the the race together display they had up. And the white woman barista behind the counter sort of rolled her eyes at me like uh, this new initiative. She did. So she was working with two African American employees. So I think there's, you know, there, there's just, it puts the, the employees themselves in an awkward, tense situation, having to discuss it. Um, prompting customers, as you said, strangers to have a discussion on race is probably not going to work. I mean, I don't want to have a discussion on race with, with <laughs> strangers. Exactly. You cannot have an honest discussion about race with complete strangers. It requires trust. That being said, the hashtag or prompting those discussions among other people 
is probably a good thing. Uh, so if the if my cup comes with a hashtag and I'm with somebody that I'm having coffee with, maybe that prompts a discussion among the person that I'm having coffee with. Or I bring the cup cup somewhere else, and that hashtag uh, prompts a discussion among other people that I trust. Right? That's laudable. So I think they need to be cre given credit for it for willing to be put their neck out and, and uh, take criticism and prompt discussion on an issue that needs discussion and uh, so good for them. They are also following it up with a uh, hiring effort so they're not just putting their mouth uh, out there, they're putting their money behind it. Uh, this is from an Ad Age article by Maureen Morrison on their, uh, they're going to focus on hiring effort of uh, disenfranchised youth initiative to uh, hire young people of color, African Americans and Latinos who are unemployed and out of school um, so they're sort of going to, you know, put some money behind it and actually hire, hire, uh, hire people as well. So good for them. And they have done uh, an effort in the past to hire veterans, and they have sparked other conversations. And I do agree that that is laudable. I just think the way it was handled was wrong. And I agree with you. You can't have that conversation on Twitter with strange or, or you know, in a coffee shop with people that, all, you know, all you usually say is I'll have a uh, mocha latte. Uh, good morning, how are you? You know, and you, I mean, it's all just superficial. So to try and change that when people are in a hurry, especially, <laughs> not going to work. So um, you have a story that I have a personal um, uh, experience with. So go ahead and tell us about the Durst thing. Oh, so this was, yeah, well, this was, we're going back to bad on this, on this one. So, yeah. um, <laughs> Robert Durst, uh, the, uh, the New York, uh, real estate magnet, uh, or part of the family of, uh, the Durst family, who is a real estate, uh, dynasty in New York, um, he, uh, is sort of the black sheep of the family, uh, and the subject of an HBO, uh, docudrama called The Jinx. And uh, so, the, if you haven't watched this show, it is a, a, it just con recently concluded. Um, it is looking at so he was suspected of murdering his wife in New York, his publicist in California. He actually stood for stood trial for the murder of his neighbor in Texas, whom he dismembered and admitted to dismembering, but was acquitted of the murder charges of that in that neighbor. Um, in the last, so the last episode of this uh, of this series, uh, he gets caught on tape talking to himself and essentially confessing to or admitting to the murders. Uh, he said, "I killed them all," or "Killed them all." Uh, he was arrested recently after this last episode aired, just before the last episode aired, uh, and will stand trial for the murder of his publicist in Los Angeles. So it just strikes me that this is sort of this is HBO's answer to the serial podcast, which was basically had the same premise. Both looked at actual murders, right? Um, Syria looked at whether this con the, whether the convicted person was actually innocent. HBO looked at whether the uh, acquitted person was actually guilty. Uh, the case uh, in Syria is being reopened, and now Durst is going to stand trial again. So my question is, is this a new genre, true crime reality shows, <laughs> where the reality happens after the show? <laughs> well, the funny thing about this is that my landlord was partnering with the Durst organization for several years. They built a bunch of buildings together. So one time I had the flu and I asked the guys at the video store to send me something funny. And for some bizarre reason, they sent me the film that Jarecki made before this series <laughs> about Robert Durst. I think it was called Everything's Okay or all good or something. And in that one, they had him also kill the family dog. And and I called, I said, why did you think that was funny? What what was funny about that? It was horrifying. And, you know, I was thinking like, oh my God, I hope he's not coming to our building. But they recently uh, ended their part, I was going to say severed their partnership, but that's the wrong word in this case. <laughs> but they... <laughs> They recently ended their partnership, so you know who knows what happened there. But he's one scary-looking guy, and and the police say that they had evidence to arrest him before the HBO so-called confession or not confession, whatever it was. But what a bizarre <laughs> person! Absolutely. So, so um, YouTube did something very cool this week. They created uh, YouTube for artists and cards for video annotations. And uh, YouTube for Artists is intended for musicians, m mostly, to help them to uh, connect with their fans and give them some better tools for their videos. And 
the cards are a substitute for the notes and other types of annotations that are a little clunky on YouTube videos and give us the ability to add links of, uh, to our website, to product sites, to a variety of different um, uh, things that we might want to promote. And they're still in development, but they're very elegant looking. They include your avatar and they uh, uh, appear. We have the ability to um, make additions and changes to them after we do a recording. And I think that this will continue to evolve. This was just launched this week, but very, very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. It should be noted that the links need to be to your own website that you verify in your account, uh, in your YouTube account. So we can, uh, for Beyond Social Media Show, we can only link to our own beyondsocialmediashow.com website. For my eStrategy channel, I can only link to my eStrategy. It would be nice if we were able to link to third-party sources so we could link to the stories that we're talking about and you could actually click on them while you're watching the video, but that's unfortunately not the case and, and maybe it'll evolve that way. But I think it will evolve cool. that way. I think what they're basically creating is a substitute for the showcase that is part of Hangouts on Air. Um, the showcase is kind of clunky because it pops out of the page where you're watching the video and um, this stays in the video and in the live broadcast so uh, I think that this is just evolving right now but to me this is just another indicator that Google Plus is not going anywhere and that Hangouts are being improved on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. Video related this I think is fascinating so um, Monica Lewins Lewinsky is in the um, in the news again. She gave a TED talk on the price of shame. Uh, it's, it's a quite 20 fascinating. Minute, yeah, it's a 20 minute talk and it's it's absolutely fascinating. It's it's a must watch. Uh, she she's basically the first casualty of this uh, high tech public shaming that we've seen more and we're seeing more and more of. Uh, in the in the video she talks about her experience and uh, being suddenly thrust into the public eye with the most intimate aspects of her personhood examined ad nauseum. You can imagine what that can do to a person. Uh, she clearly was uh, despondent over it. She made a stupid, youthful mistake, and it's open for the public, for the world to see. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that happen a lot uh, now with the ability on social to uh, to shame people for making mistakes. Um, She's giving this talk to offer hope to people who have had public shaming experiences um, and to call attention to the issue, and she does a good job doing it. She's also very cleverly reclaiming her the public definition of who she is, right? By doing this, she's, she's basically taking back um, who she is as a person, who people understand her to be by, by changing changing the narrative of her who she is, and good for her. I, she doesn't really have a solution. I think the solution is is 